Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of American cultural history. We've now arrived at the decade of the 1980s. American culture in the 80s presents a number of paradoxes. On the one hand, many people associate the 80s with shallowness and selfishness, remembered for its big hair, crazy colored clothing, and simple-minded blockbuster movies. On the other hand, there's a profound sense of nostalgia for the 80s, as many people love the music, 80s-themed parties remain popular even now, and those same simple-minded movies are considered cult classics by many. On the one hand, the decade is linked to conservative values and policies of President Ronald Reagan. On the other hand, minorities continue to push for greater equality, and some of the biggest stars of the era such as Madonna and Michael Jackson, challenged conservative norms of behavior. Finally, the oppressive fears of the Cold War, the arms race, and the prospect of World War III were front and center in the 80s. And yet, the popular culture of the era often reflected a fun, carefree outlook that belied the prominence of such fears. Popular culture in the 80s was profoundly affected by the presidency of Ronald Reagan, his policies and views, and even his wife, First Lady Nancy Reagan. Those policies, in terms of diplomacy and international relations, involved renewal of the intensity of the Cold War against the Soviet Union, and an arms race that dramatically increased the amount of nuclear weapons on both sides. On the home front, Reagan's policies enforced conservative ideals, including tax cuts for the wealthy and limiting social welfare programs. For some, these programs contributed to a prosperity and celebration of capitalism encapsulated in Gordon Gekko's famous words, Greed is good, from the 1987 film Wall Street. For others, such programs left them feeling marginalized and sometimes persecuted, contributing to a movement in song, television, and films bringing minority views to the forefront. Reagan's rise to politics was perhaps unlikely. As noted in a previous lecture, Reagan began his career as an actor, starring in many of the government newsreels produced during World War II. Politically, his roots were in Roosevelt's New Deal. However, in the post-war era, Reagan was moved to conservatism for a number of reasons, and he became a die-hard cold warrior. In his own presidency, he revived the rhetoric of the early Cold War days, referring to the Soviet Union as the evil empire, and pushing an arms race that ultimately brought the Soviets to economic ruin. While many scholars credit Reagan for the role these policies played in the eventual fall of communism, his rhetoric and the emphasis on nuclear weapons created an atmosphere of fear and worry about the prospect of nuclear war or nuclear accidents. The rivalry with the Soviet Union played out across all aspects of popular culture. Perhaps most clearly, American and Soviet athletes clashed on the various fields of sport. As both sides more or less accepted that a nuclear war would lead to the annihilation of the human race, and thus could never happen, they sought out other venues for the two sides to compete and show their dominance. This was especially true in athletics, where a small group of individuals could engage in ersatz warfare, with a clear victor serving as a metaphor for the superiority of the whole society. The clashes on the field of sport carried on throughout most of the Cold War, with the biggest stage being the Olympic Games, which took place only one every four years, and drew huge global audiences. For many years, the Russians had declined to participate in the Olympics, finally being drawn into the competition with the full backing of Joseph Stalin in the 1952 Helsinki Olympics. From the outset, the Soviets presented a worthy rival to the United States, and as the Cold War progressed, the two nations were usually at the top of the medal standings. Success in the Olympics could elevate individuals not only to fame and prominence, but also to the status of American heroes. This was especially true for Bruce Jenner, 
who won the decathlon at the 1976 Montreal Olympics and soon appeared on the cover of the Wheaties box, emblazoned in red, white, and blue. The Olympics achieved heightened prominence in the 1980s for several reasons. First, the centerpiece of the Games, the Summer Olympics, featured what some scholars have called the dueling boycotts in 1980 and 84. In 1980, U.S. President Jimmy Carter made the controversial decision to boycott the 1980 Summer Olympics, which were held in Moscow, after the Soviet Union launched an invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979. The United States spearheaded a boycott that ultimately included 65 nations. American boxer Muhammad Ali actually traveled to Africa and encouraged African nations to join the boycott, which several did. Most historians, though, have come to view Carter's decision as a mistake. Several allies of the United States didn't join the boycott. Others sent small contingents of athletes based on their individual athletic organizations. And in a few cases, athletes attended unaffiliated with any nation. The boycott also drew criticism as an overt introduction of politics into the realm of sport and the Olympics. And finally, and most important, many scholars have noted that the only real losers in the boycott were the athletes themselves, whose hopes and dreams were dashed. For many, the 1980 Olympics represented their only opportunity at Olympic victory and they never had the chance to compete. In the absence of the United States and the boycotting nations, the Soviets hosted the 1980 Olympics anyway, and without many of their chief rival athletes there, the Soviets and Eastern Bloc nations basked in an overwhelming victory in the medal count, thus achieving a public relations bonanza while the American athletes sat at home. In 1984, the United States hosted the Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. Now the roles were reversed. The Soviet Union and many Eastern Bloc nations boycotted the Games, ostensibly for concerns over the safety of their athletes and fans amidst rabid anti-communist sentiment in the United States. There's little evidence to support that argument, though, and most consider the Soviet boycott merely a retaliation for the 1980 boycott. Others speculate that the Soviets feared defeat at the Games. Indeed, the mighty American team utterly dominated the 84 Olympics, as many of their toughest rivals were not there. In the midst of a tsunami of flag-waving patriotism, American athletes like the track star Carl Lewis, who matched Jesse Owens' remarkable feat by winning four gold medals, the gymnast Mary Lou Retton, and diver Greg Louganis all became American icons that summer. The 1984 Olympics, amidst an advertising blitz, also set a new standard for profitability and marked a turn for the once amateur festival into the realm of corporatism. In the age of capitalism and Gordon Gecko's greed, the United States Olympics as a corporate enterprise seemed an apt metaphor for American society. The Cold War also played out on the fields of sport when boycotts did not interfere. In the 1972 Munich Olympics, the Soviet Union achieved an unbelievable upset victory over the Americans in basketball. The American team had never lost an Olympic basketball game up to that point and had won gold every time. In that infamous 1972 game, however, the Soviets outplayed the American team and pulled out the most controversial victory in Olympic basketball history, making a last-second shot after a wild sequence that saw the Soviets have three attempts at the basket. The Americans, outraged at the outcome, declined to accept their silver medals. The Americans had a shot at revenge for that humiliating defeat at the 1980 Winter Olympics, held at Lake Placid, New York. There, an unlikely group of college-age hockey players, led by coach Herb Brooks, captured lightning in a bottle and went on a winning streak. In the semifinal round, the youthful American team faced the mighty Soviets, which, like the U.S. basketball team, had stormed to victory in almost every Olympics and ruled the global hockey scene with an iron fist. 
Indeed, the Soviet team had beaten the American team in an exhibition game in Madison Square Garden only days before the Olympics began by a crushing 10 to 3 margin. For one night in Lake Placid, though, the Americans held their own and pulled out a 4 to 3 victory that has come to be known as the miracle on ice. For the United States, that game brought a measure of hope in an otherwise bleak era. It was not only in sports that the two superpowers competed. Throughout the Cold War, the two sides engaged in a series of cultural exchanges, ranging from student exchange programs and academic exchanges, to agricultural programs, to the arts, music, and chess. Performers from the Eastern Bloc routinely toured the West throughout the Cold War. And while the sports exchanges were usually judged in wins and losses, the cultural exchanges carried a sense of grudging respect for each other. The masterful dancers of the Bolshoi Ballet, for instance, were without question the best in the world, and left American audiences awestruck on their many visits to the United States. These visits were not always free from politics, however. In 1974, the star dancer Mikhail Baryshnikov of Leningrad's Kirov Ballet defected to Canada and ultimately moved to the United States. He became a star of the ballet and the screen in the United States, drawing critical acclaim for his role in a 1985 movie about the defection of a Soviet ballet dancer called White Knights, loosely based on his own experience. More dramatic than even Baryshnikov's story was that of Alexander Godunov, who defected to the United States during a tour by the Bolshoi Company in 1979. Godunov's defection led to a 70-hour standoff at Kennedy International Airport in New York. In the course of that standoff, Godunov's wife, Ludmila, was convinced to return to the Soviet Union even as Alexander remained in the United States. That incident contributed to a cooling of the exchanges between the two nations, and the Bolshoi Ballet Company did not return to the United States again until 1987. Karanov, incidentally, went on to a Hollywood career of his own, including a small but noteworthy role in another of the iconic films of the decade, Die Hard. In our next lecture, we'll continue discussing the role of the Cold War in popular culture in the 80s this time in the realm of film.